pleasure to have Frank Sinatra Jr. here in the house, and I'm happy he joins us tonight in the wake of his father's passing. And my friend, thanks for coming on. It's good to see you again. Good to see you again. Uh, you and the family, how you doing, Frank? We have good days and bad days mm -hmm. right now. I was listening to the story you were telling earlier on, and I remember, I don't know if you remember, that that was when I met you. That's right. That was 35 years ago. Yes, sir. I remember. It's I remember. Been a while. <laughs> I remember you coming down the hallway with, I believe, Jim Mahoney, who represented your family. No, that's not when I met you. Uh, in the courtroom with Bill Stout. No, I met you at Los Angeles International Airport on a rainy, miserable night oh, when right, I flew in right. from New York, and right. you were there, still working for Channel Five that's at right. the time here in L.A. And that's when I met you. We both had black hair then. That's, and, and, and more of it, yes, and, sir. Uh, and less, less down here, both of us had, too, in those days. In any event, while, while your, your dad was ill, and you probably knew that this event would transpire, can you ever really prepare for something no, like this, the no, death of no. your dad? Every family has deaths. And the odd thing about it, Tom, is it's like everybody's had this attitude that Sinatra was going to live forever. Mm -hmm. And this, I suppose, has to do with the fact that some people, they say, are larger than life. You know, this expression. But uh, when the time comes, that's it, you know. Um, people have said to me, uh, it's such a shame. And I say, well, it is, you know, for all of us who loved him. But at the same time, when you can have a life that goes well beyond extraordinary, a good and a healthy life for mm -hmm. 82 and a half years, mm -hmm. And when you're in no danger of dying until the night upon which you die and your death takes 20 minutes, that's not too bad. All of us have people, Tom, probably in your family, you have somebody who is suffering from cancer or something and they die over 10 years like that. Correct, you know? correct. Death on the installment plan, I think this is much more preferable. And the amazing thing about your father's life as we look back, he took on all comers. Remember the pictures of Frank Sinatra with cigarette in hand, oh, drink in he, hand? That's I mean, the whole point. He, he um, took on the all comers. Point. They said to the doctor, said, if we could only have gotten him to stop smoking. But he said, hey, you know, what am I going to do? And I used to say, you're going to get cancer, pal. He said, it wouldn't dare. <laughs> is what he used. That was his famous line yeah. all the time, you know. But uh, they had found, you see... Tom, my father's life toward the end was not failing health. It was declining health. There's a long way between the two. Mm -hmm. And what really bothered him more than anything is that when you got a guy who has been, if I can use the phrase, a thoroughbred all of his life, when you have a man who's been a thoroughbred, when he starts slowing down, it's just not going to go down too good up here for him. He cannot accept that. Uh, you may know the fact that people did in the later years of his career. My father used a teleprompter on stage. Yes, sir. I think right? we talked about that the last he time. He had you were a here. teleprompter, and the reason was that he had uh, he had he just couldn't see anymore. His memory was failing as he got older. But the teleprompter we had to make them bigger and bigger and bigger all the time because his eyes were going bad on him. He hated that. He hated it. Did he fight the, he the, went the down advance to, of age? Of course. Yeah. It did, you know, it was not for a thoroughbred to age is never a graceful process. And I used to say, you know, you're doing pretty good, champ. I used to call him champ. You're doing pretty good, champ. You're doing yeah. great. But why don't you seek out some help? He said, like what? I said, I know you're having trouble seeing. Why don't you go down and have, the, have your eyes examined? Huh? You know, everybody does it, really. They found out he had cataracts, Tom, in each eye. He went down to the... Um, at the time, he was still living at Palm Springs, California. He went to the Eisenhower Medical Center, and they gave him the implants so that he could see again. Mm -hmm. And they said, if we could just get him to stop smoking, because any doctor will tell you that that, that is, affects very severely the blood vessels in the eye. Right. So now he goes in, and I said, how's it going? And he said, I'm looking at things through a lot of broken windows, was his expression. And at the end, he was having trouble seeing the teleprompter is what it was. Mm -hmm. And this is, uh, this is the thing that saddened him a great deal, you know? And after he stopped touring, wh wh when did you know that touring was over? You, you know, you were his musical conductor. And it got director. to the point, right. I started conducting the orchestra for my father's program in 1988. And I was there almost six years. And it got to the point, finally, when he was having such trouble seeing the teleprompter. And he said to me one night, you know... You remember the great pianist, my friend Arthur Rubinstein? I said, I had the pleasure of meeting Mr. Rubinstein once. He said, Rubinstein said he finally had to stop playing when he couldn't see the keys anymore. Mm -hmm. He said, I fear I can't see the keys anymore. 
And it was, uh, it didn't... It was it, tough for him, though. Very, very tough. tough. And you don't have somebody with this kind of pride and who has been a winner, a thoroughbred, you know. And I used to, I used to, the stuff I used to do to him was terrible to get him up because he was aging. That terrible thing that happens to all of us. I did a Las Vegas show one time. My dressing room mate was Sugar Ray Robinson, one of the great fighters that ever lived. Right, right. All right? Six times champion of the world. And I used to share the dressing room. I used to see Sugar at night in his underwear. Mm -hmm. He became a grandfather during that engagement and was still at his fighting weight when his first grandchild was born. And I said, hey, champ, why did you retire? He was still young enough. He said, age, baby, the undefeated champion of us all. He accepted it, but my father never did, Tom. And how was he around home after he stopped performing? Because there was a period of, what, two, three, four years? He where... used to love to do the crossword puzzles, yeah. the New York Times crossword puzzle and everything, and he would love to do that, and it got to the point where it was too uncomfortable for him to see anyone, right. and this really, it really upset him. So he would stay, his wife, who doted on him, Barbara doted on him all the time, took care of him, and their friends would come over and keep him company, and uh, it just was the fact that he... He hated this business that was coming, mm -hmm. and it, it was yeah. sad, you know. And who would come by? Who, who were his pals? Oh, boy, let me see. Mr. and Mrs. Gregory Peck were his very close friends. Gregory Peck, who eulogized him at his funeral mm -hmm. and who lost it at the funeral, was very sad. Crazy George Slaughter, the producer oh, of The sure. Laugh in all those years. Mm -hmm. And George said to me, when I told him I was on your show, he said, Frank, on Tom's show, you better apologize to his TV audience, to every family who, because of your father's romantic records, had at least one or two more children than they intended to, you know? He said, you better apologize for that because, you know, the population increased. Some of it could be attributed indirectly to him. He's to Sinatra, right. And right. this was the whole thing. That he, they were always constantly over there. And just their, their usual friends, sure. uh, Jerry Vale and his wife, um, Oh, Kirk Douglas and his wife, sure. they, they, you know, and they consider themselves the old dinosaurs now, yeah. really, you know. And I said, gee, uh, does talent age? I mean, maybe the body ages, but the old, the talent is there, you know. Always there, always there. You know who comes in here now and again is Rickles, who's now, what, 70, 71, 72 years Don old. Don is one of the few real men in yeah, this business, that's correct. Tom. Yeah. And Gentlemen. Don was a, was a pallbearer at my father's funeral. And he wrote me a letter recently that was quite touching. He said, I can't tell you what your father did for me. Forty years ago at a little flea bag nightclub in Los Angeles called the Slate Brothers. Yeah. He said, your father came in with his pals and let me insult him. And I, it started my career going. And Don wept big tears. And, and uh, you, you forget sometimes, Tom, how sensitive people can be. You know what I mean? Um, at my father's funeral, Milton Berle was there. Milton will be 90 yeah. in a couple of months now in July. And Milton sobbed big tears, you know. Forgive me, I don't want to make a downer on No, I understand, I understand. But, to, but when you say Milton Burrow 90, I mean, to me, Isn't Milton Burrow is still on on Tuesday nights for Texaco. The Texaco Star Coming out in Theater. full makeup and, right. and making us laugh. Mr. Television. Mr. How many <laughs> TV sets in the early days was he responsible for selling, you know? Well, as he would say, my uncle sold his, my aunt sold hers. That's right, Remember, that's right. Make Milton, a joke out himself. Milton Berle, and just speaking of Milton, as brilliant as he is, Tom, that few people know, when he would do his monologue at the beginning of the show, very much like your own program here, it was a three-camera shoot. And they had no idea how to direct television in 1948. Right, right. The console, one camera was blurry, one camera was, uh, was off-center, and everything, because television was in its infancy. Milton had one hand on his side like this. He'd tell one joke... This means camera one. Oh, like a, like a baseball catcher giving signs. That's yeah. right, but he was actually cutting the camera cuts with his fingers at that time on the side when he would stand on the stage of the Texaco Star Theater. And uh, when you consider what happened with that old television program, who were the writers? Woody Allen, Carl Reiner, Neil Simon, Mel Brooks, all right? Larry Gelbarth, all these people, you know, some out-of-the-way writers. Mm-hmm who took over this whole industry in terms of comedy writing between Milton and Sid Caesar. And uh, I was very worried about Milton at my father's funeral because he said, I, he, said he, he was one of the dinosaurs like me. You don't know, Tom, what I used to do to my father to get him up. He was tired. We'd travel on the road doing his shows. And when you're getting to be 78, 79, which you and I have yet to face, fortunately, mm -hmm. He would get down. He, he was tired. He was, and I used to have to do things to get his heart going. I mean, at the hazard of my life, I would have to do things. 
I would come into his dressing room, and uh, sometimes we'd be off a few days, and he would let a little goatee and mustache, mustache come down. Yeah, yeah. Right. Okay. And I'd come in, and I would print the show menu. Here's what we're going to do in the music tonight. We're going to start with, uh, I've got the world on a string. Next tune is going to be, you make me feel so young, segue to this. So when I bring him the menu, and I said, here, and I give him another paper. He said, what's this? I said, it's a petition. He said, petition. I said, it's from your staff, the engineering crew, the stage crew, the teleprompters and musicians. You should shave before you go on. What? <laughs> and I'd go out that door, and everything that wasn't nailed down would come flying oh, yeah. right behind me, right? <laughs> this kid his heart going. To get him up like that, I used to say, yeah, there's a... There's a chick in the front row says she's madly in love with you. She's going to give you the Tom Jones treatment. He said, what's the Tom Jones? Well, you know, Tom Jones, women would throw their bras and yeah, panties yeah. and hotel keys. He said, she's going to do that to me? I said, no, she's going to throw her things. He said, what things? He said, you know, a pair of support hose, a hearing aid. <laughs> things like, he said, oh, ha, 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 ha. You're real Lenny Bruce, aren't you? <laughs> right? So then I said, she says she's in love with you since she saw you in that movie. You know, he says, what movie? I said, you know, the one when you played William S. Hart's grandfather. William S. Hart's, right? And he would, bang, stuff would come flying out of there. And I said, well, it's going to be a good show tonight. Yeah, good show tonight. And I'd smile at all the guys, and he'd get out there and rip them up. And I would look at him every so often. I'd be conducting, facing away, and I'd turn around, he'd look at me, and I'd give him this, fight. Get in there and fight. We played one night, Tom. Let me interrupt you for yeah. a second. got to do commercials. Okay. We'll continue here with Frank Sinatra Jr. and you on the toll-free uh, right after this uh, short break. You told the story here about, uh, you know, turning around after you were conducting and saying, you know, keep fighting, keep fighting, and you were about to tell another story. We had a thing one time, Tom, in, uh, in Athens in the early 90s, and we were over there. We played at the Olympic stadium where they had the, the big Olympic Games. Sure. 48,000 people came on this very warm, beautiful night in Greece. And in the afternoon, I went in with the crew uh, to get the Sinatra show on. We had to, the, the dates were booked so consecutively, one day to the next, that we actually had to leapfrog sound and technical equipment. We had stage lighting, we had television cameras because the, it was to be taped. And they had big monitors around the auditorium for close-ups, as you see in certain concerts. Mm -hmm. The television cameras, all the television equipment, everything had to be leapfrogged from one city to the next. Uh, the crew that afternoon was speaking English, Polish, Russian, Italian, Greek. We had people from all across Europe putting crew. together, right? We get ready to do the show that night, and I print the menu. We have a Greek opening act, a piano player, a singer, who was very popular in Greece. Suddenly, a man comes to me with an armed guard and a braid. He's a diplomat from the Greek government, and he speaks English. He says, Mr. Sinatra, the prime minister and his cabinet have been meeting all day in emergency session, and they all are coming to the concert tonight, and they're afraid they won't be here in time for the opening of the show. And we're wondering if you could hold the show back. And I said, let me take it right to the boss, uh, Mr. Envoy, right? I went into his dressing room. I said, Dad, we got a problem here. The prime minister and the entire Greek cabinet wants to come into the show tonight. They're in an emergency session, and they want to hold the show 45 minutes. And he said, oh, yeah. He said, we're not, we're not going to insult the, the entire government of this country, you know. Right. Hold it. Now, he's fine, right? Sinatra's fine with it, Tom. The opening act, this Greek piano player singer, gets his nose bent out of joint. <laughs> he picks up his music, walks out. He boogies, right? So now I go in there before the show that night. We're getting to start. 48,000 people, and now in come all the blue lights of the Interpol police and everything, and they seat the whole Greek cabinet. And I said, we got a problem. The opening act has defected. He said, what does that mean? I said, you are the whole show. That's one hour and 45 minutes. So I got two menus. We had enough music for two shows. I said, we're going to do both shows back-to-back -to -back tonight, champ. And it was hot. He got up there. All right, now, from your perspective, you've got the camera live. Let me turn around. What I see of him is this now, right? He's got a microphone. He's up here. Right. And I'm where you are, Tom. And every so often, there'd be an interlude. He'd turn around and say, how many more? And I'd say, get in there and fight, fight. He did the whole show, 76 years old. All right? He did the, two, the double show that night. And afterwards, I hugged him and I kissed him. I said, you're still a champ, Dad. You still get in there and fight. When the show, you know, tired as he was... The show is over, and 15 armed guys with Uzis come push us out of the way, and a guy comes and grabs Sinatra off the stage, 
takes him into a limousine with the prime minister's car, and they go rushing off with a quadrant of police to some cocktail party or something. And I said, now you see what it's like to be a star? Isn't that great? Yeah. He showed up about 2 in the morning, and he looked at me, and he said, oh, that ouzo. <laughs> <coughs> You know, Tom, I think back through the years. Let me, let me, let me ask you about, about you and, and your dad. Yeah. And the last times that you were with him. I, and you know, I'm not get, well, I don't want you to be maudlin. I'm not, not trying to make ask. you cry. But the last no. couple of times you were with your dad, what you talked about, what you said to him, what he said to you. I said, how you feeling, champ? He said, I'm doing fine. He said, I'm doing great. He said, I'm sick and tired of everybody trying to make me a helpless invalid, you know? You have to understand, Tom, he was really in no danger of dying until the night on which he died. Mm -hmm. And, uh, All the trips to the hospital. And for tests and everything. Right. And I, I'll tell you, there's a story right there. I went to the hospital one time. We put him in for some tests. Now I go to get him back, bring him home. Now he's all doped up. He's groggy, right? Right. You get him home. Now if your cameras can see this, you're lit nice and white. Now here, I've got one half of him, and I'm putting him on his bed. Now what he sees is right here. Mm-hmm. All okay. right? Okay. He's got the top of my head. The next thing I know, while I'm putting him down, I suddenly feel a hand go. Yeah, pulling at your went, hair. Ouch! What are you doing that for? He said, is that real? I said, of course. What kind of a question is that? He said, oh, I thought for a moment maybe you were one of us. <laughs> right, he couldn't believe that. He said, how did you arrange that? He said, nobody in his family has hair past 35. I said, well, I won't tell you. He said, well, why don't you get the hell on out of here, too, you know? But that was his reaction. He noticed the top of my head and that I still had a little bit left. This was, this was his attitude. Why was the family so secretive, though, about why he was going to the hospital? Because, you know, the, the, I'll the, tell you the, why it the, was, the, the curiosity that the media had, I think, was based well, more on love uh, yeah, but, uh, than on trying some, to no, find out uh, something. Some of, some of the media, Tom, right. some of the media. But you remember the others, uh, the tabloids had my father dying once a week for three and a half years. Since 1994, sir. That's about right. And why they do this is for one reason, to sell tabloids. Of course. All right? The objective of such publications is never truth. It's money. If truth ever appears, it's coincidental. But the fact was, every time this would happen, it would be such a thing with, a, with the crowds and everything right. uh, that that was why it was kept as quiet as possible. And not only that, my father, Tom, you've got to remember, was a typical old Italian. He didn't like medicine. He mistrusted doctors, and he hated hospitals, mm -hmm. okay. you know? <laughs> it's that simple. To get him to go to the hospital, he says, oh, no, oh, 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 no, you don't. I'm not going to any hospital. This is his attitude, you know. That's everybody else but not me. What about when uh, Sammy died? When not Dean good. died? How not good. The last time I did your show was leap night. I was thinking about it. It was February 29th, 1996. Dean had just died, and That's I told right. you all the That's Dean right. Martin stories with him. Dean Martin and he played a nightclub one time years ago. This was the relationship they had. Rumor had it that this nightclub had become more of a liability to the owners than a profit-making potential. Gotcha. And one of them said, I'm afraid they're going to torch this place after we close, all right? So one night they had a crowd, and Dean is waiting in the wings to go on. <laughs> my father's standing next to him. And suddenly the fire marshal shows up. Oh, really? Well, to check, you know, yeah, to make sure the house isn't over. And he's standing there, and Dean went over to him. He said, hey, pal, it's tomorrow night. <laughs> 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 Dean was... Dean was incredible. I told a story at my father's funeral, I mean, part of the eulogy, that one day he, in front of the very church his funeral was in, he got a traffic ticket one day about 30 years ago. Who, Frank? Yes. On Santa Monica Boulevard. On Santa Monica Boulevard, he went through a red light or some policemen stopped him, and he went over to see him, he looked at his license, and somebody walking down the street made him in the car. The policeman said, well, this, and he looked up, and there were 600 people standing there, and he said, holy cow, what's going on yeah, here, right? right? Now, Dean goes on the Joey Bishop show that night, the old ABC mm -hmm, Joey sure. Bishop show, sure. right? And all Dean, and this hit the news, of course, right? All Dean knew is that it had happened in the afternoon in front of the church. And Joey said, hey, Pally, what was it Frank uh, Francis trying to do, start a riot? And Dean said, oh, now Dean had to think fast. He said, oh, no, Pally, Frank was on his way to confession. He found he was short of material. <laughs> Let me take a fast break. With Frank Sinatra Jr., we'll continue after these messages. Uh, 
uh, because he had an altercation with somebody in the media, uh, when he was accused of being involved with organized crime. What, what did he say about those things to you? I asked him one time about one of those Senate hearings one time, and I said, what is it? What's going on with that? What do they ask you? He said, one of the congressmen said to me, uh, uh, were you or were you not the man who actually was running after the train in the last scene of Von Ryan's Express? I said, this is what they asked you? He said, oh, yeah. That's it. And when he had those altercations, Tom, in those days, it wasn't called the media. I mean, that word hadn't been created right. yet. Yeah. He was young and, you know, quick to temper in those days at the time, and uh, he mellowed out and everything. And it's really, um, it's a thing to, to look back on a man's life through the years. I can remember the times, I think, when did you come from Milwaukee to California? I know you went well, to Well, I New came York from first. Philadelphia, actually, to, right. or, from Atlanta to uh, 1963. Right. Well, before that, here, when I was a little boy, Tom, we had a local show on KTLA in those days, the Spade Cooley show. Mm -hmm. Spade Cooley wore the cowboy stuff oh, and played the, music the violin. Show. Yeah, and I believe show. he went to prison. I think he died in prison for murder or something, if my memory serves me correct. And this was a very fly-by-night show, 1950, 51. Mm -hmm. And one night, I turned on this program. My father was, I was a little boy, and there was my father singing. It was a $50 show because he had lost everything. He had nothing left. He was drawn. And these were the hard times. These were the very, very hard times. He went into movies more, and I, I was thinking about it tonight to tell you that at one point in the old, you were talking about Chasen's Restaurant, which mm -hmm. is no more, the old Chasen's Restaurant on Beverly Boulevard here in town. One night he was in the bar in the 50s, and he went into the men's room, and as he was going in, another man was coming out. And he looked up and recognized it was Boris Karloff, and he said, Mr. Karloff, he said, all my life I've admired you, since you scared me to death when I was a kid when you played Frankenstein's monster. You're a marvelous actor. And Karloff blushed. And he said, oh, he said, I'm not an impression. He said, you too are a fine actor, young man. But you must learn to act with your voice as well as your face. You're a singer. For you, it should be easy. Now they find out. They talk for a minute. They find out their neighbors. So all through the King's Go Forth period, the Some Came Running period, in the late 50s, his movies, every time my father would get a script, he'd go over to Karloff's house, and Karloff would read with him. And he was, Boris Karloff started grooming him as to when to hold back on lines mm -hmm. and everything. Most mm -hmm. people, you know, these are stories that no one knows, yeah, Tom. Yeah. I'm not sure I understand what he meant when he said that the senator or the congressman said, well, are you the person who was the last one off the train in Von Ryan? No, no, it's chasing the train. At the end, when he got killed with the machine gun by the German soldier, he was running after yeah, the train. But, but is that what the congressman really asked That's him? what he asked him. That's what he asked. I looked at him, and I asked him the same question. I said, you're putting me on. Is that what they really... He said, that's what they asked me. He when said, you asked him what, what the hearings that's were all right. about, this that's was right. involving... They involved. wanted to know whether or not it was really me or a stuntman chasing the train at the end of On Ryan's Express. So then they asked him nothing about organized crime? Oh, or... sure they did. Did you ever own this? Well, then he said, no. You know, this kind of thing, the usual stuff. But then, while they were sitting there, I asked him, was he chasing the train yeah. at the end of On Ryan's Express? When you came home that night in December of 63 in the back of the Bel Air Patrol, mm -hmm. and you went inside your mother's house, mm -hmm. what did your dad and mother say to you when you got home that night? What was that scene like? My mother wept bitterly, bitter tears. My mother, Tom, had aged 10 years. I had just seen her just a few weeks before. She had aged 10 years. And my father was very, very edgy, as he had been all along. Mm -hmm. Uh, at that particular point in time, I was immediately whisked into the capable hands of the FBI to give a statement. Of course. I said, I have to do this while I still remember it. And uh, he kind of disappeared. He stayed in the background at that point because he wanted the appropriate agencies to do what it is that they had to right, do. to brief you, find That's out right. what happened to your recollection. That's right. And then they had to take statements from me as to what I remembered, this, that, and the other thing. This took about, I'll bet you it took seven hours the first night which was good because I was able to give them some information. Yeah. That led to the arrest of the people that That's perpetrated right. this crime. That's right. And you will carry on the legend? Uh, you'll go out with the orchestra and sing the songs? I'm still working, you know, still going everywhere. Thinking of the audience, Tom, his audience in those last years when I was conducting the orchestra for him, the people who came to his concerts 
let alone having the records and the movies, but the ones who came to his concerts, many of them over and over again, I don't know if they are aware of the fact that they made his life possible at the end. He loved good living. He loved good food, good clothes, good drinks. He loved his friends, his family. He loved to go to great places. But what got his blood going, what kept him alive, was getting up to go on the stage, mm -hmm. you know? And his audience made his life possible those last years. That was the thing that, you know, that was very moving to me. The love on their faces was just, uh, I will never forget it. Keep the music playing, my friend, and thanks for joining us tonight. It's always a pleasure to see you, Frank. Thanks, Tom. I hope you'll come back before we're through here, okay? Okay. Okay. Frank Sinatra, Jr., back with Roy Blunt, Jr., whose name I've horribly mispronounced after these messages.